Welcome to Electrified, it's your host, Dylan Loomis. A quick shout out to the three of you who used my Tesla referral link recently. I know there are plenty of links available out there, so thank you for choosing mine. Ben H, Lawrence A, and Derwin S, congratulations on your new Tesla. Troy Tesla made this data public that we've been talking about really all year. He said, in the first eight months of this year, Tesla sales across the EU are at 198.3 thousand, down 16.6% from 237.8 thousand during the same period last year. Starting in March of this year, the 2024 sales have been below the 2023 trend. So as we've been saying, yes, domestically in China, things have been going well for Tesla recently, but across the EU and in the United States, it's a bit of a different story. Plus more sales in China domestically and less across the EU will likely be a margin headwind for Tesla as the EU sales are widely accepted to have higher margins than the China sales. Plus, Tesla is still offering very low APRs across China, so yeah, the Cybertruck will continue scaling and nearing profitability later this year, but there are certainly still negative margin trends out there, like this one. Here's another chart that Troy made public. We have Tesla deliveries in the US for the first half of last year, and here it is for the first half of this year. Looking at the USA column for last year, the number was 328.3 thousand in the first half of the year. Meanwhile, throughout the first half of this year, in the US, Tesla is at 290.6 thousand. As always though, there's more to the story. We had the Model 3 changeover earlier this year that has had a big impact on Model 3 sales. They have since recovered out of the Fremont factory, but in the first half of this year, that was a huge factor. This final table, by the way, is the difference between the first half this year and the first half last year. I said it a few weeks ago, I'll say it again, there's a very real chance at the end of this year, Tesla sales are actually lower than they were for 2023, which would be the first annual decrease for Tesla in its history. And again, if that happens, just prepare yourself for the media frenzy that will ensue. On X, Bilal shared a pretty great story. He convinced a close friend to buy a Tesla. Right away, told him to buy a USB drive for the dash cam footage. Two days later, his friend got in a bad accident. He never got the USB and his whole family assumed the accident was his fault. But they submitted a data privacy request to Tesla and within one day, Tesla had emailed him a zip file of some video footage from the accident. They had all angles of the crash and the truth was clear. The other driver was 100% at fault. His friend was exhausted exonerated and a six-figure settlement followed, a settlement that changed his life. These of course are the Tesla features we hope that we never need, but I don't think it's talked about nearly enough that they're there in this type of scenario. How many people have no idea? And then Nick Patain actually shared some images of one of these Tesla privacy requests. Here's one of these vehicle data reports or VDRs. You get the time from impact for things like auto steer, cruise control, the brake application, and the seat belt status. You get a plot of your vehicle's speed and time, the area of detected impact, the date, the time, and precise location data. And there's multiple pages like this, so just to share one more, you get things like the accelerator pedal position, and same with your brakes and again, your speed. But the fact that Tesla may also have all of the angles of the video footage, even if you don't have a USB on board is an underrated feature. Get your USB and learn how to use it, but more people should be aware of features like this. If you ever want or need a copy of your Tesla data, you can go to tesla.com slash contact us and I'll have this link below. Jordan from The Limiting Factor made his Generation 2 4680 teardown from UC San Diego video public. As the kids would say, it's a banger. It has a ton of great information. I would still encourage you to definitely watch the whole video, but I wanna share the highlights for those short on time. The TLDW, the energy density is up 11.5% on the Gen 2 cell compared to Gen 1. The new nominal energy density, 272 watt hours per kilogram. This is on par with Panasonic's 2170 cell and the Gen 1 was 244 watt hours per kilogram. The two main reasons for this improvement a thinner cell can and a higher energy density cathode material. On the former, the Gen 1 cell can was 0.6 millimeters in thickness, whereas with the Gen 2, that's down to 0.4 millimeters. So they've reduced the thickness of the can itself by about 33%. On the latter point in the chemistry, Generation 1, it was nickel manganese cobalt 811, the numbers being 80% nickel, 10% manganese, 10% cobalt. 
but we get a change with the Gen 2 chemistry. It's now NMC 955. 90% nickel, 5% manganese, 5% cobalt. More nickel leads to greater energy densities, and Jordan did say he's not aware of a chemistry with a greater percentage of nickel and a lower percentage of cobalt. In the table he shared at the bottom, we have the Gen 2 cell, and you can see the cobalt percentage is down to 5.24%. If you compare that to the Gen 1 cell in the table above, you'll find the cobalt percentage at 12.4% and 11.92% he sent in two different Gen 1 cells. So comparing the Gen 2 cell to batch 2 of the Gen 1 cell, the cobalt content has been reduced by over 57%. Despite these improvements, the Gen 2 cell still does not contain any silicon, the anode is pure graphite. So chemistry wise, the anode is largely the same as Gen 1, but with Gen 2 the anode is 4% less thick. The cathode thickness is also down by 17%, which can reduce heat generation during charge and discharge and could improve charging speeds in the future. During the teardown, as expected, it was confirmed this cell was only using dry battery electrode for the anode, but Tesla has told us they're expecting to go full dry by quarter four of this year, which means DBE finally for the cathode. We're also still expecting that Cybertruck charge curve update improvement that Drew Baglino promised back in April. Jordan said if and when Tesla starts adding silicon to the cell, then this could boost the watt hours per kilogram up to 300. Plus, Tesla still has other improvements it can make to the cell like lithium doping and asymmetric lamination. But as it is right now, this Gen 2 4680 cell is on par with the best high nickel battery cells on the market. And again, that's before the production of the full dry production of 4680s later this year. And that's supposed to be one of the biggest breakthroughs. Now, I'm sure many of you out there are well aware of all of the negativity around the 4680 project this past year, which really all started thanks to one Reuters report. Separately, there was this report that Cybertruck deliveries were being held hostage by 4680 problems. We literally had some analysts and industry observers saying that if Tesla doesn't figure out 4680 soon, they may scrap the program altogether by the end of this year if they don't hit certain targets. Right when that came out, I said to me, that sounds like nonsense. Even if they miss the targets by the end of this year, it would make no sense to scrap that entire program after all of the work they've put in. Especially given that we've actually known they've continually been making progress, it was just a bit slower than some were hoping for. But thanks to Jordan and people like Brian from Futuraza and the whole team that was involved in this teardown and this study, we now have reliable data that really tells us Tesla is actually one of the big boys now. The Gen 2 4680 cell is already on par with Panasonic's 2170s with a full roadmap of improvements still ahead. And Tesla is doing this while reducing the cobalt content significantly and Jordan also said that Tesla may be working on an NMC973, which would lower the cobalt content even further. Now, there's no guarantee that Tesla can scale up mass production of the DBE for the cathode, but there are a lot of signs that they're making great progress from that regard. Even if Tesla could not pull that off, they already have a competitive cell that they're producing themselves, making them less reliant on third parties. But if they can crack the cathode DBE production at at scale later this year and add in these future improvements, things are now looking incredibly bright for the 4680 program. Most people really won't understand the magnitude of this statement, but Tesla has a clear path to become an industry leader when it comes to making batteries vertically integrated. And if they can reach mass scale, the costs will continue to come down, putting them in a beautiful situation. Not too bad for just a car company. And I would strongly encourage you to go watch Jordan's full video. There's plenty of other detail I did not include. I'll have it linked below. Like it, share it around, show him your appreciation for content like this. And again, this wouldn't have happened without people like Brian from Futuraza contributing greatly. So I'll have his link below as well. Go follow him, show him some support. He's been a longtime friend of the channel and his Tesla coverage is criminally underrated. Omar said 1010 will be the most significant moment for Tesla since the unveil of the Model 3, to which Elon said, in my opinion, yes. Forbes was reporting how the Irvine Police Department bought a Foundation Series Cybertruck. 
They said the Cybertruck won't be used for patrolling and will instead become part of the department's Drug Abuse Resistance Education Unit, or DARE. It's something we can highlight at our events where kids can come and take pictures. This is a smaller one, but highlights a bigger trend that Tesla's been undergoing lately, and that's buying up distressed properties to convert into showrooms and service centers. This time around in North Hollywood, Tesla will take over a vacant Kmart to turn it into a showroom, service center, and vehicle spray booth. They said the building should be ready for operation potentially within the next 30 days. Another one along the same lines, Tesla's taking over an old theater building that they plan to convert into a delivery and customer pickup center. This one in Chatsworth, California. If you happen to be in Anaheim, California today or tomorrow, you can visit Tesla at the largest renewable energy event in North America. The Tesla setup and team will be in Hall D like Dylan. As Sawyer pointed out, the Tesla shop in China is now offering a Model Y rear skylight, which is really more of a canopy for about 100 US dollars. It's waterproof with UV 50 protection. And they said it's easy to install without additional fixing to the ground. So hopefully this eventually makes its way to North America. Heinrich Zane gave us a pretty detailed video about the Tesla Semi factory progress. So if you're into construction especially, I think this video would appeal to you. And I did wanna share this view as things are now coming together pretty quickly after months and months of not much of anything. James James May, who has had an illustrious media career, finally got a chance to drive the Cybertruck, and fun fact, he actually owns a Model 3 refresh. Something I would just like to say about the Cybertruck is it's got the quietest electric windows I've ever encountered. Look at that. I think that's probably better than an S-Class. Okay, look, here's what I think. I think the Cybertruck is actually very ballsy and quite humorous, but I am quite glad it exists. And if I could make a little appeal to Elon Musk, could you make something about the size of the Model Y or maybe even a little bit smaller, still like a Tesla, still with all this Tesla stuff on it, but styled like this? I'd go for that. Honestly, kind of an underwhelming video overall, but maybe the cyber cab will appeal to James in the future. And how about this study I found, the effects of EV charging stations on the economic vitality of local businesses. I said earlier this week, most business owners should be rushing to get chargers at their locations as soon as possible. The study analyzed data from over 4,000 EV charging stations and 140,000 business establishments in California. Results show installing one EV charging station boosts annual spending at a nearby establishment by 1.4% or about $1,500 in 2019, and then 0.8%, about $400 from 2021 to 2023. The effect is more pronounced when a point of interest is within 100 meters of an EV charging station, where spending increases by 2.7% in 2019 and 3.2% 2 from 2021 to 2023. EV chargers tend to attract higher income exploratory visitors and local residents. Moreover, they notably enhance business in under privileged areas defined as disadvantaged or low-income areas. The study highlights EV charging stations as drivers of local economic growth and stresses the economic benefits of multi-host EV charging station setups. It's kind of obvious to us, but we've had some weddings earlier this year and the hotels we had to stay in, most of them still don't have EV chargers. We got a new press release from this company, Factorial, that's been working on all solid state batteries and they're saying they've come up with something in partnership with Mercedes-Benz. The press release highlights all of the breakthroughs of their all solid state battery, Solstice. They're touting energy density of up to 450 watt hours per kilogram. And get this incorporates a novel dry cathode design for more efficient and sustainable production. I bet that sounds familiar. Solstice's high energy density can extend EV range up to 80% while significantly reducing vehicle weight and increasing vehicle efficiency. I'm sure everybody's thinking, all right, awesome, when can I buy this 500 plus mile range Mercedes? Well, they said Solstice is expected to be available to customers by the end of the decade. 
Now, if you ask me, this press release is about five years too early. I'm still out here hoping that Tesla either invests in XAI or it's opened up to Tesla investors somehow. And along those lines, OpenAI is now in talks to raise $6.5 billion at a valuation of 150 billion, which is a pre-money valuation and one that's a bit higher than the $86 billion valuation that people were talking about earlier this year. However, the sources that I shared for everything I said in the original post were mainstream media articles. However, some of the sources that I cited for everything I said in the original post were actually mainstream media articles. Thus, people were saying I'm a hypocrite. But just because I would argue that a majority of the articles coming from mainstream media are filled with noise does not mean that they can't ever add some value here and there. There are still some good journalists working at these companies that bring insight we would not otherwise have if it weren't for them. What I'm trying to get at here, especially after the debate the other night, is that we need to deploy discernment no matter who we're listening to, no matter what we're reading. And look, a lot of the news we talk about on this very channel comes from the mainstream media. Some of it's been true and others have been egregiously false. But this right here, what Elon said, hits home to me because there's people very close to me that I've seen being fleeced or programmed, whatever you wanna call it, about many different topics. And many times when I meet somebody new, they'll ask what I do, I tell them, and then they go on a mini rant about something about Tesla and it's usually negative. And most of the time it's coming from legacy media or the nightly news. So yeah, I plan to continually call out the media categorically because I think it's well warranted, but that does not mean there aren't still some gems that we can extract from this overall industry. And the hope is that citizen journalism ultimately takes over in the long run and slowly replaces this media establishment. But that's enough ranting. I really do need an electrified after dark. Tesla stock closed the day at $228.13, up 0.87%, while the NASDAQ was up 2.17%. It was a normal volume day for Tesla, trading about 8 million shares above the average volume the past 30 days. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. Please like the video if you did. You can find me on X linked below. And a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.